what's going on? Episode number 94 of the Agostino Zinga Show with me, your host, Agostino. Do you like my little Basquiat trim I've got on here? Right? Don't, don't, look, don't look a little bit like Jean-Michel Basquiat. We're all children of Basquiat, aren't we? All us uh, creative black fellows with dreadlocked hair, aren't we? We're all, we're all kids of, of uh, good old Samo. I quite like it. I'm probably going to change it. But yeah, anyway... Who cares about that? Welcome back to x no Show, episode number 94 with me, your host, Agostino. It's a great, um, cool Tuesday morning. I'm going to put on my clout glasses because we're going to get clouty up in this bitch. Oh, there we go. I can see loads of influence around me now. Ah, so <laughs> how are you guys doing? How's life? Hope you guys are well. I've just come back from a nice little 3.11 mile run, which is about 5k. I was meant to run yesterday after work, but then I realized quite off quite quickly that my body just cannot um, do it after work, especially if I haven't brought my stuff with me. Because when I used to run beforehand, I used to, someone I used to run before, I used to run from my workplace to home. So I just like change, then go run. But to get home and change, then go out again, it doesn't work. So, you know, you, you start realizing little things about yourself that you, you're not that great at. So I'm not good at working out after work, but I'm really good at waking up early in the morning and banging out a workout, banging out a podcast, uh, reading a little bit, banging out a blog and then going to work. Do you know what I mean? I'm good at doing stuff in the morning. I'm, I'm really, really good at that, getting and going. Actually, there's a book about that, actually, um, that I've got somewhere around here uh, that talks about the way some cre- legendary craves have split up their days. Tim Ferriss spoke about it. Anyway, I'll try and find it another time and I'll maybe recommend it to you guys. Oh, there we go. I've got it. Daily, it's called Daily Rituals. One second, if you watch this video, sorry to see my back, digging this out from my library here. So this book here, whoops, fuck. Put this back. So don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. Don't bloody fall. Anyway, this book here is called Daily Rituals by Mason Curry. Mason spelled M-A-S-O-N, Curry spelled C-U-R-R-E-Y. Mason Curry, Daily Rituals. As you can tell, I've absolutely banged this book out. It was one of the books that was on Tim Ferriss' book club. I'm not sure if he's still running at the moment, but it was a really amazing thing that he did for a while. Tim Ferriss, if you're not sure who he is, the guy from the 4-Hour Workweek. Um, the guy that the internet kind of loves to hate. Um, he did the 4-Hour Body, he did the 4-Hour Chef. Um, he's also got Tours of Titans, another book that I have from his too, that's somewhere around here. Um, just a really legendary individual. Someone who came who came into my life at just the right moment. You know when you're kind of like, I, was, I kind of went through a bit of a bad spell working at Nike in 1948. It was a bit of a shit experience, you know. I, I thought I was going to get given. I thought I was, still in a, I was still in an entitled mindset back in those days, right? I thought I was going to get given a job upstairs, um, handed to me on a plate for some regards, right? And I, you know, it was a bit entitled, it was a bit short-sighted, but I had good reasons to think that because everyone else around me didn't really seem like they were really good at their job. I, didn't, I wasn't really working alongside world-class talent. Or if people did come to the store that were from above, they were some, they were, the people that were amazing who you could tell, you know, knew, knew what they were talking about were senior members of the team. People who were really older, who kind of had a lot of experience working in different areas of the company. Someone like Fraser Cook is a good example, right? He was probably one of the only people that really impressed me. Like, um, when that's when I met him in real life, like, okay, cool. This guy knows what the fuck he's talking about. Um, and, and, but of course he's, he's what he's had the advantage of opening a store, opening several stores, being a consultant. You know I mean, he's he's worked in different countries. He's got a different kind of scope. But most of the other guys in the office were like, you know, straight up corporate heads just who just hang around long enough. You know, and um, I'd assume Nike, the, as most big companies like that, who are over 400 people deep, they don't really do well in terms of getting uh, dead without the company. Right. They just hold on to people because, you know, people just get jobs and just hold on to a job, hold on to some level of responsibility. And it's quite hard to kind of like analyze your workforce and see where the pain points are. And, and OK, cool. This he or she is the person we need to get rid of in order to kind of make us more efficient. And people just hang up, end up just hanging on there for dear life. So to cut a long story short, I was kind of in that mindset where I kind of, you know, I was a bit bummed out. It didn't really work out. And Nike, but I was also thinking maybe I need to try harder at getting a corporate job, right? Do things a bit different. But I'm just not made up that way. I can't kiss ass. Um, I don't really, I'm, I'm not good at cowering to... Um, people in authority who just, you know, who could just have a senior position because they just hang around for long enough. Um, I respect those who kind of command respect. You know, that kind of a, idea. Like, it's just things that, are, things that are a little bit at odds with how the scene works. So I was kind of reconsidering, maybe I need to change my approach. And then I've stumbled upon for our work week and that really changed my idea of what success means, right? Because in my head, I thought it was about money. And then that kind of book kind of details how 
um, real success or really making it in life is about being time rich, about being able to do the things that you enjoy, hence a four hour work week, which kind of got a bit of a bad rep, you know, in, in the press because, you know, it made it seem as if like he was kind of coming at the angle from the kind of like a biohacking angle of like, oh, how to how to get away with only sleeping three hours. It's like you can get away with sleeping three to four hours, but why would you? Do you know, why not sleep six and seven and get some rest and then and then like Gary Vaynerchuk mentions a few times, it's not about the amount of time you sleep. It's about what you do when you wake up, right? It's about utilizing the time. People are so hung up on the sleep aspect of it and all that malarkey when they should be trying to squeeze as much as they can out of what they, the time that they have available. Um, another person that said it, um, something Hackenbrook, he's a really big CrossFit athlete. He kind of subscribes to the same idea. It's not about how hard you work. It's not about, it's not about, it's not about your, how hard your workouts are. It's about how hard you work out during your workouts. Do you know what I mean? So it's about pushing yourself as much as you can. Blah, blah, blah. Long story short, he, has, he had a book club that he did uh, for a short period of time and he recommended some great books and Daily Richards was one of, the big, one of the best ones that he kind of recommended. And in the book, it kind of details loads of influential creatives who are kind of like, he kind of breaks down their, um, their daily rituals, what they kind of get up to, how they break up their days in order to kind of get the most out of it. He's got people like David Lynch. He's got Woody Allen, controversial. Um, he's got Kingsley Amos, uh, WB Yates. Loads of influential people in here in this book that you should probably check out. Just a really great book. Um, Franz Kafka, who's amazing too. Let's do. Let's just quickly read the Franz Kafka portion of it. You can see what they're kind of like talking about. So Franz Kafka. Um, in 1908, Kafka landed a position in the Workers' Associated uh, Insurance Institute of Prague, where he was fortunate to be the converted single shift system, which meant office hours from 8 or 9 a.m. in the morning until uh, 2 or 3 in the afternoon. Although this was a distinct improvement over his previous job at a different insurance firm, which required long hours and frequent overtime, Kafka still felt stymied. He was living um, in his steamed, is it stymied or steamed? Stymied, I guess, right? Um, he was living um, in his family's cramped apartment where he could uh, muster the concentration to write only late at night um, when everyone else was sleeping. A lot of writers, I like that, right? They can only write late at night. I can only do this podcast early in the morning. Because I don't have anyone around, um, I can make as much noise as I want. I just feel comfortable. You know what I mean? Um, maybe it'll change when I get a studio. I'll probably change my kind of studio, my uh, recording time. But this is why I like to do it. And I usually do write on my blog um, when I come back from work too, which is quite late at night sometimes, especially during the week. Um, anyway, it continues. Kaf- Kafka, as Kafka wrote to uh, Phyllis Bureau in nine in 1912, time is short. My strength is limited. The office is is uh, a horror. The apartment is noisy. And if a pleasant um straightforward life is not possible then one must try to wriggle through by subtle maneuvers oh that's where it might come from right um yeah i remember that quote actually that subtle where's that from there's a subtle maneuvers quote that's awesome i fucking love that quote actually that quote's amazing i need to highlight it oh sorry to knock in the mic there i got my highlight here yeah i do that's an amazing quote right that is an amazing 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 quote Uh, so good i'm gonna repeat it again um, Kafka wrote to Phyllis Buer, who is, I'm assuming his wife, right? Back in the day, because there's, there's a picture actually of them together, as you can see on the camera, can see that, hopefully. If you're not listening, if you listen to this, there's a picture of Franz Kafka with Phyllis Buer. Um, it, the, the quote says, time is short. My shrimp is limited. The office is a horror. The apartment is noisy. And if pleasant, straightforward life is not possible, then one must wriggle. One must try to wriggle through by subtle maneuvers. That is one of the best quotes I've heard in my lifetime, because that definitely describes me in uh, absolute t so yeah i recommend you check out daily rituals it's an awesome book um it kind of does stress the importance of trying to squeeze the most <coughs> <coughs> that you have available at a time available um and it does put to bed the whole assertion that people can sit down and write for several hours because some of the best writers in the world don't write for more than two do you know what i mean like, especially um concentrate effort it's less about trying to write for seven hours you know you know you know how you were back in school and you're trying to cram you weren't really cramming really you were just kind of like you know obsessively looking at your book over a period of six hours but the kind of real work that you got done was maybe within two hours maybe an hour and a half so this kind of um advances that notion that instead of thinking that you know stephen king is sitting there writing for eight hours a day which he isn't he's trying to get he's trying to basically break it down it might be He's trying to write a paragraph every 15 minutes. He might be trying to write a page an hour. He might be trying to sit down and write as much as he can for two hours. But it's a concentrated effort for that short period of time. And then you just stop. And you pick up again tomorrow. And then over time, that kind of, um, what's that word called? That consistency over time 
will sharpen and hone your skills so that over time you'll be able to get a lot better at it <clears throat> and it'll just come second nature. <clears throat> I've even noticed a change with myself recording these podcasts now three times a week, back to back, Monday to Friday or Monday to Wednesday or sometimes Tuesday to Thursday. I've noticed a change that I'm able to like articulate myself a lot better. I hope so. Hope I don't come across um, dummy and rambly and all that malarkey, but I'm, I'm able to articulate myself a lot better. I'm able to get my thoughts out clearer. Um, I'm still umming and ahhing a lot more than I'd like to, but over time, I'm sure that will kind of get honed out. But of course, over time, doing this thing, again and again and again every other day it's gonna help so yeah i don't recommend you check it out daily rituals by um mason curry it's an amazing book something that i've kind of read sporadically over time and i thought yeah and, uh, and even just live on air live on air i plucked out a quote that i thought was inspirational anyway apart from that yeah so i've been running i finished this as well yesterday blue zones by um dan butner an amazing book um, I definitely recommend you check it out. And essentially, it kind of like you know, I mentioned before, it profiles, um, it profiles blue zones or centenarians that live in blue zones. And blue zones are areas where people um, live the longest, so between the ages of ninety and one hundred and twenty, for the most part. So they go and they they go to these areas around the world and they kind of analyze what the, what makes these people special, why they're living longer, and most of the time they're living outside the Western world. So it makes it even more um, interesting to kind of like look into. Because, you know, people are like, oh, Western world has everything. We have all the medical advancements and still people are dying um, from smoking cigarettes and all that sort of sh stupid shit. So the book is really good. It kind of details what everyone kind of knows. There's a real good quote at the end that talks about dieting that I thought was interesting. Because, you know, it's always, anno it's always fucking annoying when I, whenever I pull out my salad at work and everyone's kind of looking. Or you pull out something that isn't a sandwich, right, in front of people. They just get all flipping giddy. Like, oh, wow, you're really healthy. Everyone's got some sort of fucking opinion on it right it's it's one of those things that just annoys me it's kind of like running a little bit right you see so many people running on the streets who running with such bad form and just kind of um miserably grinding out the miles but just running like absolute shit right and it's like because running is so easy it's such a low-hanging fruit all you need is a pair of trainers right and you can run but it doesn't necessarily mean you can run well, but everyone just runs, right? It's like when you go to the gym and you see a guy doing dumbbells and he's fucking swinging his back, back and forward, like doing dumbbell curls. Like, it's like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Do you know what I mean? But, you know, because it's just the weight. You see people moving their arms up and down. You get a bit of a strain in your arm. You feel like you're working out. And dieting is probably the same sort of thing, right? So there's this quote that I saw about dieting that really made me laugh and really put succinctly um, summed up the, my thoughts when, it, when I kind of pull out some things I'm eating. Where is it? Something about um, 6% of diets don't work. I think it might be here. Uh, na, na. Yeah. The quote says here, this is from The Blue Zones by Dan Butin. The quote reads as following, none of the centurions we met ever... No, sorry. None of the centurions we met were ever on a diet. And none of them were... Ne, ne, oh, Jesus Christ, what can't I read aloud? None of the centurions... Well, none of the centenarians we met were ever on a diet. And none of them were ever obese. No diet yet studied works for most people, says University of Minnesota Dr. Bob Jeffrey. You can get a diet to work for about six months and then about 90% of dieters run out of gas. Even the, even the best programs are effective in the long run only for a small percentage of participants. That's a bit like, duh, right? But it needs to be stressed, right? Most diets won't work for most people. But most people, what they do, especially after watching videos... Because I've been obsessed. This has been what I've been doing over the weekend, right? It's really mean. It's really ups, It's really bad. I know people get pissed off about it. But I fucking love watching um, fat cringe videos. So you you normally, if you, if you don't know what fat cringe videos are, I'll, let, I'll, I'll give you a bit of an insight. A fat cringe video is usually a clip taken from My 600 Pound Life or a show, a, a show around that kind of gauge or usually an interview with some sort of um, body positive lady or some sort of thing like that, right? And usually what it is is like these big heavy girls um, trying to rationalize why being big and heavy is okay and why it should be socially acceptable. And it's annoying, right? It's annoying because what it basically says is kind of like, um, it's essentially like the whole pronouns thing, right? Like no one really gives a shit about pronouns for the most part, right? No one's that really that bothered. What they're bothered about is when um, the people that are advocating for the use of pronouns want it to be passed through legislation, want it to be passed through the government, and want people to be compelled to call them by their preferred pronouns. But really what people want is just like common sense stuff, right? So if I'm talking to you uh, face to face and I happen to call you he or she, but you don't want you to be known by another pronoun and you let me know, then it's up, you, it's up to you to correct me in that instance where I'm, where I'm there with you face to face, right? 
in a kind of one-to-one um, exchange. The same way um, some uh, Samuel, some Sams don't like to be called Samuels, or some Samuels like to be called Sam. I don't like to be called Sam, like that kind of thing, right? But you wouldn't go around like trying to get a law passed, like saying my name is Samuel, not Sam, kind of thing. It's just a bit. It's a bit. It's a bit annoying, right? It's a bit conceited. It's a bit self-righteous. It just doesn't come up come across the right way. And the same thing for these body positive women. You know, no one minds that you're fat. No one really gives a shit for the most part. People just get annoyed when you try and pass a bluff that somehow being big is can also be healthy. Like you know. There might be a small proportion of women out there or people in general who can be 400 pounds plus and have no health issues, right? It, it can exist. I'm not, I'm not naive to it. It's like, um, it's like the people who smoke cigarettes, right? You, we all know someone who smokes cigarettes for, for the, like, who's, we know a friend who has a parent who smokes cigarettes for fucking most of their adult life and they have absolutely no, you know, noticeable health problems that we can tell from the naked eye. Of course, there might be something going on the inside, but for the most part, they seem fairly okay. But that doesn't mean that everyone should be out there puffing, I don't know, 30 packs a day. It doesn't make any sense. But it makes me laugh whenever I watch these videos with these uh, fat positive people or body positive people on the YouTube. Because they always state, most of them have the same sentence that they kind of kind of go back to. Which is like, oh, I tried every diet under the sun and I realized it didn't work for me. So I'm just accepting my body for what it is. Which is, you know, proper loser mentality, right? That's proper loser mentality, like... You know, I tried to make a change with my life. I tried to succeed. It didn't work out, so I just accepted my position. It's like, come on, man. That is... That, you're just giving up on life? Like, and it's no, no, I'm not giving up. I just knew that it was doing me more harm than good. What they were doing essentially was crash dieting, right? You could diet for three days or a week, and then you get so hungry, you build up such, an, you build up such a reserve of hunger for processed food and sugars, that when you finally pass a Greg's, right, <laughs> or a Percy Ingo's, you go fucking ham, you know when you pass a Percy Ingo and they just, they just pulled out the fresh fucking rolls and cinnamon rolls and croissants and shit and um, hot pastries like the cheese and onion melt. You're like, oh, God. And the people in Percy Ingalls are so nice, isn't it? I was anyone notice that. No, most Percy Ingalls I've been to, the, the women are the, usually women that work there. Again, don't get, don't, be, don't get in your high horse. But the people that work in there are usually so lovely, like really, really lovely. They're, you know, so welcome. It feels like you're, it feels like you're going to visit your nan. And she just, she won't let you leave the house without eating something. Just fucking f- pushing food down your throat. So that's the only thing that's annoying, right? It's just like, oh, I've, I've been on loads of diets and, you know, and I just can't get the weight off. It's just I'm holding loads of water. It's like, come on, get out of here. So for the most part, diets don't work for everyone, right? But what this book basically details is that it's less about diet and more so about lifestyle habits, right? So it's about um, permanently changing your diet. And now this is something that's very, very important. A lot of people won't do because I've seen, I've seen videos of really big girls I saw this, saw this video of this one girl who was like obsessive eating potatoes and cheese. Now, she might be a bit of a freak. She might be playing off of the cameras a bit, you know what I mean? Like being a little bit of, um, you know, just for shock and awe value. But, you know, she has a boyfriend who, who seemed like fairly in shape, who kind of ate normal kind of food, like steak and vegetables. And he was trying to feed her a bit, piece of broccoli. And she was li- physically shaking and crying. Like she couldn't handle it. I can't eat the broccoli. <laughs> Imagine being a grown adult and crying because of broccoli. I remember seeing that when I was in school. You know, you'd have that kid in class who would cry because his mum put a tomato in his sandwich or something. She snuck it in there. Do you know what I mean? On some fucking incognito shit. And this woman was shaking. <laughs> she was shaking, crying about broccoli. And her boyfriend had to come over and give her that fucking boyfriend hug. It was like super pathetic, right? But for the most part, this book basically details that, which is a change that I probably would like to make. And because I, you know, I had the the other bits of protein in my diet, especially I had some bits today, some meatballs with my eggs. I had some chicken in my salad, but it basically stresses the importance of having of only eating meat twice a week, right? Of basically eating a plant based diet. Um, it stresses the importance of having a lifestyle that incorporates a lot of walking, a lot of low locomotion, right? A lot of moving around, whether it's walking a little bit extra to the next station, whether it's not getting a bus stop in front of your house. Um, whether it's taking the stairs on the way to work, like loads of locomotion stuff, it's always in front of it. Whether it's take, whether it's another thing that's fucking <coughs> a lot of people don't do. Whether it's carrying your shopping home, it's something I've been I've been doing for a while. I guess it's because of the of the of the immigrant mentality, you know, in me, where my parents never got buses or cabs home from shopping. Um, we'd always carry our shopping home, like fucking bags of it on either either arm. You know what I mean, like farmers carrying shit. I mean, and and you you build up a technique of carrying bags in your hand and, and your hands are bleeding. That my hands were just permanently callous from the time I was fucking six. I mean, going to Atom Park and carrying fucking slabs of meat down the road. Like, uh, uh, uh. Do you know what I mean? Me and my mom just like, come on, 
<sighs> 21 minutes to go. Walking from Abton Park to Canning Town, man. It's not fucking close. I tell you that. It's not close. So um, that's a habit that I've kind of built up. And you, you don't see a lot of millennials doing that nowadays. I mean, everyone's jumping into a fucking Uber with a couple of loaves of bread and a bit of cheese. Like, come on, man, walk. So loads of that kind of stuff is incorporated in there. And that's, that's most of it. So imagine, imagine having a mostly plant-based diet, right, from Monday to Friday. Being an actual plant-based food eater, not like a vegan or vegetarian where you're eating fish and chips. And, so you're eating chips and cheese and shit. Not that kind of vegetarian, right, because you meet a lot of those ones, right? But I'm talking about mostly a plant-based diet. So loads of loads of legumes, loads of salads, right? Uh, lentils, loads of nice healthy healthy plant based food, tofu and all that malarkey, and then incorporating a bit of protein, you know, um, once a week, maybe twice a week, not nothing bigger than a hand size. Uh, mostly eat, mostly drinking um, water and all that kind of malarkey, staying off the fizzy pop and all that stuff. Because you don't need to say that to people, do you? Really? Do you need to tell you should not be drinking fizzy drinks? You don't really see people drinking fizzy drinks anymore nowadays, do you? For the most part, you might see people drinking like energy drinks, like those off-key um, uh, bootlegs of like Red Bull and stuff. But you don't really see people walking down the street with like a bottle of Coca-Cola anymore. It's like such a taboo thing to see, isn't it? For the most part, I don't see it at all. Um, unless you go to the hood and you see guys drinking like um, what's that? What's that? Fa- what's that new Fanta twist that everyone likes from a chicken shop? It's like a little can. Everyone drinks it when they come out of chicken shops. So, like you get four wings and chips and you get a little fizzy drink which is not the best when you're eating spicy hot wings but what do i know anyway this book basically details it mostly plant-based food um for the week mostly moving around locomotion walking extra the extra mile to the station um mostly um also keeping a close group of friends that you can kind of you know that keep you alive and keep you on your toes that whole idea about having two people on your level two people two people below your level two people above you know so you can kind of have the the spectrum and you can kind of see where you are um you can't that competition in life is necessary don't believe what people say there is a competition in life when you get out in the real world there is a competition even for fucking sales and jobs you have to compete with somebody out there do you know what i mean everything has a competition so that's a very good book that i've read and i finished and i'm happy with it and now i'm moving on to the next one on the list which i'm not sure which one it is but it's one of these books here i'm gonna figure out later anyway enough about me rambling on let's get on with some topics what have I got here written on the docket? Number one. Number one. Shane Jaws Shane Shane Josh Shane Shane Dawson. Jesus Christ. Shane 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 Dawson and Jeffree Star documentary on YouTube. Probably one of the best things I've watched on YouTube since forever. And when I mean best things, I mean like um, original content someone on YouTube has created. Like, you know, YouTube bloggers usually do the same old tired bullshit that I probably do too, which you can check out on my channel because I've got loads of blogs on there. Bing! Um, but yeah, Shane Dawson is probably one of the longest running YouTube personalities on YouTube probably. Like, he's, he's a super OG. He's had his ups and downs on the platforms, but now he's kind of progressed into this new phase of his career where he's kind of acting as a bit of a... He's kind of acting as a bit of a mentor to some of the young people coming up, like some someone like Tana Montague, who kind of had a bit of a meltdown with the whole TanaCon stuff. He's been uh, really, he's been a really, he's been, it seems like he's been a bit of an assistant to people like Charles Jeffrey, who's another kind of like Jeffrey Star, uh, comes from the kind of school of Jeffrey Star, where he's kind of been involved in loads of controversy in the kind of makeup industry world. Why I know this, don't ask. But he's also been um, pushing, he's like also been kind of coming into Avenue where he's making these feature feature length documentaries that are usually cut up into different parts with key personalities within the kind of youtube um hemisphere and it's probably this is probably one of the best documentaries because jeffree star is um someone that really divides opinion jeffree star is someone who i have been familiar with since old school my space days he was kind of one of the big breakout stars from myspace i remember when jeffree star kind of got signed to convict music and all that kind of malarkey that was during the whole warp tour era you know like um edm was kind of Oh, not EDM. Most of electro music was kind of big during that time. You know, Busy P, um, and all those kind of guys like Cassius. Like it was a really big era, and you know, Jeffrey Star kind of popped up from that era as a kind of like a really weirdo alternative version of Lady Gaga, right? A kind of really aggressive version of Lady Gaga, probably like a Mickey Blanco before Mickey Blanco, right? That kind of era, but it was kind of probably ahead of his time, and it didn't really work out. And I hadn't really dug in deep as to why it didn't work out because you know. Uh, Fast forward a few years later, Jeffree Star's now this like multi-million dollar selling uh, makeup artist, right? A multi-million early makeup artist, and then he makes another evolution and becomes the uh, the owner of this brand, Jeffree Star. That's kind of you know 
one of the best makeup brands in the world has some of the best packaging um gets rave reviews from loads of vloggers and loads of makeup artists who kind of don't really have any time for jeffree star as a person and it kind of really goes up and booms and then he kind of hears a bit of controversy again when loads of footage from his old days kind of surfaces where he's kind of using loads of racial slurs you know when people are digging up loads of old tweets they found loads of old videos of jeffree star really kind of going at people and saying some really obscene stuff and that's when kim kardashian jumped out of the window for jeffree star and kind of got you know pelted as well so I had a really interesting um, time. But Shane Dawson has made a really good in documentary that answers all those questions and more that I really think you guys should check out. I'm going to kind of get up a clip about it on YouTube. Hopefully you guys can see. But I highly recommend you check it out. For those of you who are not familiar with Shane Dawson or Jeffree Star, I will give you a, a fair warning if you're not comfortable watching this kind of thing. It is incredibly gay, right? It's probably one of the most gayest things that you can watch. But I fucking love all things concerning gay culture you know raw paul's drag race and all that malarkey uh queer queer eye like on on netflix is it queer eye or queer folk is it queer I'm pretty sure it's queer eye isn't it it's got it's got a new seat they've actually got a new season in it they've been given a new season is it queer eye or queer folk what's it called uh queer eye yes yeah, queer eye on netflix recommend you check that out too it's an amazing makeover show with f is it five gay guys who kind of go into people's lives and give it a complete makeover um and yeah it's an amazing show to watch but i, I recommend you check out this shane dawson clip i'm gonna get what a little clip up on youtube so you guys can see what i'm talking about but it's really fucking good man probably one of the best things i've watched this year i guarantee you it's probably one of the best things i've watched this year um let me get up a random thing i'll get up something like this so you guys can see it hopefully you guys can see this Ever since I was a little girl, I just love things in my mouth. Come in hot. <laughs> All right. Where is she? Are you nude? She's uh... <laughs> scaring the dogs. <laughs> Hello, darkness. Darkness, whatever your name is, I. Okay, how are you feeling, honey? Sorry. <laughs> oh, how are you? Okay. What's... Oh, 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 okay. What's that? Okay. Well, I'll just I'll join you. There we go. Hi. <laughs> um. So. How are you feeling? I never saw you. you look amazing. Um. No, I'm sweating. It's hot. Um. I tend really tight. Let me Maybe loosen it so you can breathe. You, you seem a little asthmatic. Do you want my inhaler? Wait, really? <laughs> oh my god, I love this. Yeah, you have asthma? Yeah, I have since I'm a child. Oh no. <gasps> Struggle. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's really good. I recommend you check it out. It's amazing because it goes through um, loads of Jeffree Star struggles. It goes through um, setting up the business. It goes through the the um, the kind of failure of the music career. And it's really an amazing up and down story. Of, of course, there's the big kind of takeaway that Shane Dawson's kind of really shocked about. And I really didn't know as well is the amount of money that um, Jeffree Star's kind of generating from all these different kind of business ventures. It's not solely makeup, which you will kind of, you know, it's kind of obvious from the naked eye. But it's good that he kind of spoke about it. It's more so the merch company he owns with a few partners, his property he owns, uh, the weed business that he has. Like everyone's kind of got a little investment in weed because it's just like it probably it's easy money to make if you've got already capital to invest in it. So it's really cool um, insight into someone's life that you probably don't know about. And especially and it gives a lot of context to the kind of outrage that happened when you, you, you saw the whole clips of Jeffree Star freaking out and saying those really insensitive racial slurs in the middle of the street. I was like, oh my God, how did you say that for? So it really explains the whole idea. You kind of get an idea where this person's life has come from and there's a lot of pain there. That's per usual. Whenever someone's really outlandish or a bit, um, they're a bit too confrontational in, on social media, usually it's because they're hiding some sort of like psychic pain. Um, but the real good takeaway, the real good, the real, the really interesting insight actually to Jeffree Star is his relationship with his boyfriend, Nate, who uh, before meeting Jeffree Star was quote unquote straight, right? And it kind of really... I like it because um, I've always been, I've always been a bit conflicted with the with the uh, with the uh, again. This is something probably not a big uh, little hot, it's probably not a hot take, but just my own opinion. I've really been conflicted with the whole gay identity because whenever I grew up or where I mean, most people, especially growing up in a hood, anyone that was gay in the hood, right, was really gay, right. There wasn't any middle ground. When a when a girl was gay, she was very butch looking, and when a guy was gay, he was very camp. 
You never saw them in between. You never saw the... And you never had the... I'm sure they did exist because, you know, a lot of people out, out there are gay. Then I never saw a really butch... Sorry, a really um, male energy um, machismo gay guy. It didn't exist in the, in the ends. Or a really feminine girl that happened to be a, into other girls, lesbian. It didn't exist. And that used to really annoy me. And then when I got into the outside world, outside my little bubble living in the ends and got into university and went to workplace, I saw the same sort of tropes, the same sort of archetypes being recycled. And it kind of really pissed me off. And then it kind of only kind of subsided a little bit when I got to Berlin and I saw fine, finally, right, going to the Berkheim, I saw gay, gay people, right, whether they be men or women, whatever they identify with, who just looked like me, right, who weren't necessarily overly camp, who weren't uh, covered in glitter and wearing the tightest of denim jeans and all that malarkey and you know who knew how to vogue just general blokes who liked who liked other blokes or general girls who liked general girls and i thought that was so amazing and i thought sometimes um i i i'm of the feeling that 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 kind of that kind of um identity of like you know it's like, sort of like the hip-hop thing you into hip-hop you have a fucking new era hat and a big jacket on you know and a chain and shit it's a little bit it's a little bit pastiche you know what i mean it's a little bit cliche so I was happy to see their relationship because it's very unconventional in the quote-unquote terms, right? Because Jeffree Star, by his own definition, is a bit um, gender ambiguous, right? Um, he doesn't mind if you call him a he or she. He doesn't really care, right? But of course, you know, he does his nails, very feminine makeup-wise, hair, wigs, the dresses. Like, you know what I mean? It's very feminine, but he doesn't really care if you call him a he or she. He's not bothered. Then you have someone like Nate, who's a boyfriend who they kind of met on, on social media, who's kind of a Midwestern kid who kind of comes from a, a, an area in America that probably isn't the most gay-friendly, I'd assume, right? Probably in that Bible belt, who kind of just fell in love with this person. He didn't care if it was a woman or a man. He just fell in love with that thing that was in front of him. And, or that person that was in front of him, sorry, not thing, the person that was in front of him. And I thought that was very, it's so sweet and so amazing to see that kind of love being portrayed in the media or social media in general. And I'm hoping that the young kids that are kind of watching or follow Jeffree Star will see that you don't need to prescribe to the kind of set um, uh, stereotype of what a gay or a lesbian or whatever looks like, right? You can kind of have this weird, ambiguous um, look towards you that people will just have to get along, that we'll just have to put up with, right? We'll just have to accept for. And that's what's lovely I like about Jeffree Star too. He came up in, an, in a scene on era where he would walk down the street and get spat, right? And get held glasses at. So he's got a resolve, a determination to succeed that's probably f like a freakish level. Like he's just, he's, just he's, 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 he's definitely got that thing about water off a duck's, duck's back because he's probably seen some real shit in his life, right? He said he's been jumped by guys and stuff. <clears throat> which I'm sure people nowadays don't really get as much as they did back in the days. So it's a very interesting documentary. I highly recommend you check it out. Um, it's a, I think it's, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a five part documentary. I'll link to, I'll link to part one on my, on my show notes. Let me just get up. Uh, let me see if the play is up on Shane Dawson's thing. Has he got it on there? Yeah, there we go. So it's five videos long, right? I, I've got, I've got the playlist on here. So I'm going to, I'm going to link towards it in my, in my show notes, I'm going to copy the link towards it now, actually, so I don't forget. And then post it into my notes. But I don't recommend you check it out. Jeff, um, Shane Dawson and Jeffree Star documentary. It's a fucking amazing one. He's got a really good one as well with Tana Montague, who is a girl that um, had a disastrous uh, TanaCon um, convention that happened a few weeks, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, actually. So if you're interested to find out who the Tana girl is, who everyone kind of hates on the internet, check that out too, because it kind of paints a different picture of the whole scenario. So, um, what's next on the documentary? Jack Master shits into shits in the kettle. Look, man, I had no idea this was going on, right? And I saw on Resident Advisor that Jack Master apologized about his actions when he was at some festival. I was like, what the fuck happened at the festival? So, you know, sometimes when apologies aren't the best idea, this is a, another example where apologizing for something probably isn't the best idea because it just brings more attention to something that not everyone even knew about. Um, <coughs> it's absolutely hilarious, right? Jack Master, I feel your pain, right? I fucking feel your pain. Shitting in public and getting in trouble for it right i've been there i've done it okay um or shit in places that you shouldn't shit at having no recollection of it then being told what you've done and having to fight your case and still being told fuck out of here i know what your pain is right i've been there trust me um 
So, this story broke right the other day. And again, I had no idea this actually happened until I saw Jack Master had apologized for something. So, sometimes, like I say a few times, I'm sure some celebrities have been told this by their media handlers or agents and stuff or their publicists that sometimes apologizing for something can just bring more light to the situation. So, Resident Advisor broke this story the other day or didn't break the story because Jack Master actually issued an apology himself. But let me get it up here on the screen. So, it goes as following. Um, da 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 da. Jack Master apologizes for inappropriate behavior at Love Saves the Day Festival. <laughs> oh, no! This is fucking amazing! Jack Master, what are you doing? I want to preface this by saying, right, that Jack Master is one of my favorite DJs, and I've always said, right, I've always said, I've always said, something I've always kind of like stipulated and kind of said is my criteria when I rate best DJs. I like my DJs who get fucked up and have fun. I hate the robotic Ben UFO surgeon type DJs who are amazing, who are amazing at what they do, but they just look fucking lifeless out there. It's like a flipping a math, mathematical equation, right? It's like they're, I don't know. It's it's like they, I don't know. It's like they're in front of a classroom and they're trying to break down a sum. I'm not interested in that kind of thing, right? I want to see a DJ up there having fun, enjoying themselves, and I want to see a DJ that just just can't believe that they're being paid this amount of money to play songs that they didn't even make in front of a crowd, right? That's just kind of like, you no, know, the pinch is like, gee, this is amazing, man. I, I, I mean, just wow. Like just having good fun, doing a bit of gear behind the decks, drinking, um, hi, um, hugging random people that just like, you know, hangers on that want to suck your dick. I love it, right? I love it. I love it. I love it. So Jack Muscle is of course one of my favorites because if there's anyone who's um, famous for looking like absolute um, wreck behind a DJ booth, right? But still manages to pull out absolutely killer sets, right? This is the this is the thing with Jack Master. I think it's a I think it's a Scottish in him. He looks like he could just fall over at any single time behind the decks, right? But he's so good at his job that he still manages to pull it through. Um, a good example is his back-to-back -back set. Actually, before I play this video, right? There's a good example is, is Jack Master played a back-to-back -back set the other time with um. Peggy Goo, right? Where was it? Where, what what was it? Peggy Goo. Let me see. Jack Master Peggy Goo. What where was it? Uh uh not Circle Loca Barcelona. Where was it? 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 Jump they were back to back somewhere. Um Jack Master. Let's see if it's got on here. Jack Master Glasgow. This that Nope, 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 nope. Which one was it? He's wearing a tracksuit. Where? Um, what? Not Circle Loco. Where is it, man? Which one was it? There we go. Is that one? No, no, I can't remember. Where is it? I be for no. Ah, oh, where is it? What's that festival in the UK? UK festival. Where was it? It was a UK festival. He was at somewhere, right? He was playing a set with Peggy Goo. Um, let me see if I can get up. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, because this is this is really important to see, right? Because the video of him playing back to back, and he's absolutely well, like well weathered, weathered, right? And he still managed to pull out the bag. So let me see if I can get up here. Is it Park Life? Maybe it's Park Life. Is it Park Life? Might be Park Life. Let me see if I can find it on here. Jack, is it Park Life? Maybe it's Park Life. That's not Park Life. Ah, oh, fucking hell, man! What is it? I know what podcast ever. I'm searching for a video um, of Jack Master playing and re looking really fucked up, and I can't seem to find it because I'm an idiot. Um, it was that festival that Virgil played at recently too, where he kind of walked out in front of the stage on that runway, and was. Um, where is it? Anyway, the story goes as follows, right? Because this is this is gonna be. This, dumb hard to find the actual thing but jack master is a i'm a fan of him because you know he looks he looks like he has fun behind the decks you know and when i mean fun i mean fun right so he's a good guy i love i love jack master good egg right but you know he, li he likes to get on it I don't, I don't think that's any secret to anyone that kind of watches anything that he, he does right live live dj sets so this article came out <coughs> and it says the following right so i'm sure you guys can see this now on the screen uh, Jack Master has apologized for his behavior at this year's Love Saves the Day Festival. The Scottish DJ took to Facebook to post an apology for what he called inappropriate behavior, including acting offensively to staff at the event and damaging equipment. He said he takes full responsibility for the situation and has been making changes to his lifestyle to prevent it. The quote says the following, right? 
And that did, uh, this is the thing, man. You, you know, you sound like you have no idea about what's going on in someone's project and it just brings it to light. It's like, no, Jackmaster. So it's the following, right? Jackmaster says this um, <laughs> on Facebook, right? I'm a firm believer in equality and treating people with respect. As such, I want to deeply, unequivocally, and pu- uh, publicly apologize for my actions and behavior at Love Saves the Day Festival this year. Um, I behaved inappropriately and offensively to staff at the event and damaged equipment. <laughs> While I was heavily intoxicated, although I don't recognize a person recounted to me, I take full responsibility for my actions and the effects of those involved. I'm sorry. Come on, load. Um, as much as, as this was uh, out of character, right? Substances are an individual's choice, not an excuse. I have already made changes to my lifestyle and I will continue to do this ongoing. It's like a thinly vague, you can read between lines what that means. Over the last few weeks, I have done everything in my ability to confront and address the repercussions of my actions head on and apologize for personally to those that are affected. This post will serve to remind me that my behavior was unacceptable and it is a bid to address issues in the wider events and music industries. I appreciate the professionalism of Love Saves the Day for taking a strong staff for their staff whilst maintaining openness throughout. And then I was thinking I was about it. I just didn't understand what was going on. What do you mean? What's happening? What's what's the whole deal, right? And it only took me to read the fucking comments, right? A couple of comments deep. And supposedly Jack Master shit into shit inside a fucking kettle. <laughs> and there's an image of him doing it as well, right? So I had fucking no idea that this happened. Absolutely no idea. Absolutely no idea, right? Um supposedly there's meant to be footage or something. There's a picture of it of him doing it. Um where is it? There's a picture of him doing it, right? I'm not sure if it's actually him or if that's just a Photoshop. But there's a picture of um, him doing it, which I can't... Where, where, where was it? Was it on the Resident Advisor page? But anyway, I saw a picture of him doing it, right? There's a picture of him doing it from the CCTV camera that he actually shits inside of a kettle. Now, I can't lie, man, Jack Master. I can't laugh too much because I've fucking been there, right? I've done public shits and you've kind of got in big fucking trouble from me. You don't remember him in the morning. Like shit so big that they, they know it can only be you, right? You know that kind of shit that you make that everyone knows it has to be this guy. No, who else is it going to be? Who else shit's that big and that long? Oh my fucking God, Jack. <laughs> it's just a fucking legend. Because <laughs> I remember hearing stories of like other DJs, like, um, who's a famous one? I think it was Lee Foss, who I think is kind of gone a bit sober now and he's gone a bit straight laced. Remember during the whole like, um, that era when all the Jamie Jones was kind of, that kind of crew was kind of popping up into, uh, into the zeitgeist that Lee Foss was like an absolute caner and I think he used to get booked from loads of like gigs I think it might have been an Irish gig or somewhere somewhere in that kind of area where he kind of got so fucked up on Ket that he couldn't do the set he was kind of like sleeping behind the decks so people the, 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 the event organizers had to play for him instead he just had to stand behind the decks so, they, so people could see Lee Foss behind the turntables and I think he got penalised from DJ fees for it. Um, he got, kind of got put on the plane and got sent back to LA. But you hear quite a lot of stories of it. There's obviously the, the infamous uh, video of... Um, do you remember the infamous video of Seth Trockler? Like, absolutely off his head. At that festival, wearing a sailor's hat and a small panties. Where's that one of him? Let's see if I can find it. There are legendary events like that, right? Where people are just so fucked up. This is the one, right? Do you remember this set to shut off the video? And he's, 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 I think he's straight laced now. I think he doesn't do any drugs or he doesn't drink. I think he just smokes weed and uh, overly, but this is back, this is back in the day, Chef Truxer, when he wasn't, you know, when he was off his trolley. Boom, boom, check, boom, check, boom, check it out. Whoa. Girl, ugly girls, ugly girls, ugly girls in Miami. Ah. Okay, so what are you doing, eh? Can you talk us through your outfit? It's a very fine ensemble. Oh uh, yeah, so uh, my outfit today, you know, I'm um, I'm wearing my girlfriend's pants. Uh, it was it was a really hard decision, you know. I, I had some designers come. Uh, they approached me. They're like, hey, we can have some diamonds and some other things. And my girlfriend's like, you know what, boy, I got you some short shorts and a fucking luchador pan. And I was like, you know what? That's what I'm all about, right there. We in Miami. I got some new top siders in mint green. Bam. Boat shoes. I, I, I'm just a boat man, as you can tell. So, I mean, we're here hanging out in Miami. I have fucking bats. Fuck. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, we're here in Miami hanging out with DJ TV, uh, DJ Mag TV. I, I, I don't know, call letters. It's like w, WKRW. This is DJ Mag TV. I don't know, but oh, uh, yeah, shit is cool. I'm mean, sorry for using profanity. I don't know how this, this works in the, the UK, but yeah, you know, it's having a good time. I want to look like kind of like. Florida 1970 retiree, you know? It's like incognito cognito. 
And you're maybe you're living in Berlin now. How, how does Miami compare to Berlin? I mean, Berlin. It's funny, yeah. So um, Berlin is like oh, it's like whatever for me right now. I'm actually I'll plan on moving to London. I think uh, it's the hottest, the hottest place on the planet right now. It's cool. People are up for everything. So yeah, there's that famous video of like uh, Seth Trucks that really just fucked up and off his nut and he kind of relaxed a little bit. There's obviously the famous video of uh, Ricardo Villalobos um, scoring behind the decks, like someone giving him, giving him, giving him a little cheeky packet that he kind of picks up. Actually, let me see if I can find that one. Uh, Ricardo Villalobos. I think that's probably one of the best, one of the famous ones, isn't it? It's like, might be, should be one of the first ones. He's behind the decks and someone gives him a little packet. A little cheeky pack. Oh, just this one, innit? No sleep. This is the famous one. You know. Because I don't like to sleep. <laughs> Sometimes it's also horrible. Sometimes it's, it's always about like your biggest fears. Your You are like always fearing. Yeah, like, which is um, especially coming out in dreams. So I prefer not to dream. You are like the whole, like if you're <laughs> dreaming, you're having a strong dream. This is having a really strong influence on on the whole day and of course the dreams is like working some information and bringing things in order but like I prefer not to exactly it's not what you want to have or what you it's more or less uh, to be confronted with the things you are always afraid of some people are afraid of not being loved some other are afraid of not being powerful enough some others are afraid of being alone or Others are uh, afraid to lose. I prefer not to sleep. <laughs> no, but like, I don't like sleeping. Yeah, we, we, you, you probably don't like sleeping, mate. That aggressive flipping nose wipe. <laughs> Absolute legends. But, you know, that lifestyle, man. Being a DJ, right? Because I... <coughs> <coughs> I'll defend Jack Massa. I can't defend myself, you know, because I'm just a regular old guy with a nine to five, you know. He might shit in public sometimes and get in trouble for it. But, right... Being a DJ, right, touring the world, doing as many dates as Jack Master's doing, right, and I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna get it up here because I wanna, def I wanna defend Jack Master because I fucking love the guy, right. So if you go back on Reddit's advisor here and you we click on Jack Master's name, it should link to obviously his RA page. So Jack Master, being a being a touring DJ like Jack Master, right, he's it's summer, it's a summer, right, so his his schedule's fucking off the chain. He's touring all over the world. It's really difficult because I'm hearing a lot of DJs now, especially I uh, listen to. This Giles Peterson um, podcast series called, I think, The Psychology of DJing or something like that, right? And he interviews um, Seth Truxler, Black Madonna, Cassie, um, I think Black Coffee or somebody else. A few other people, right? Check it out. Um, he interviews Young Marco, right? I think he interviews Young Marco too. Um, and he kind of dissects the psychology of a DJ. And for the most part, the more mature DJs, the older DJs have stopped doing drugs. Like Cassie's a good example, but no, she had a kid. And um, or she had a kid during during the time she, her career kind of started blowing up a little bit, so that kind of helped to change things. Black Madonna's the same sort of way as well, but I, I don't think Black Madonna even does any drugs at all. I'm not too sure. But for the most part, the mature ones I've been listening to a lot of them are now kind of like I'm sure you've seen. I think Sven Vaz got a, a resort somewhere or kind of like a, a place out in Bali. But a lot of those guys are going to Bali now and doing that whole like unwinding thing, where at the at the beginning of the season or the end of the season they kind of do a thing where they kind of go away to Bali and do like no electronics a complete kind of like isolation thing loads of meditation loads of yoga loads of plant-based food to kind of reset the body a little bit right because that touring schedule unfortunately for a dj it requires you to live on the edge you have to live on yet you have to be on the, you have to be on a cusp of breaking point every single day for the most part of it especially if you're playing like because i can't even like i get tired nowadays right because i play a set on fridays again i'm djing this friday the 17th at tappies for like so tap you can see the link below on the show description i also pop it in my audio podcast link so you can check that out tap east in westford stratford for night called tapped on the 17th of uh was it what are we now august um yeah from 5 to 11 so check that out too so I, I get tired, right, playing from 7 to 11 or 7 to 12 sometimes, right? Or when I play at, late, at the Leighton Sun Star, which I'm going to be playing on August 26th on, August, on Bank Holiday Sunday. Um, and I play there from, like, I don't know, let's say like 9 to 11 or 9 to 1, right? I get tired then. Imagine if you're like a, a professional DJ or like a touring DJ and you play somewhere for four hours. Then you have a two-hour break and play somewhere else again for another four hours and another, t and another two-hour set to end it or end it at the end of the night. Like, that kind of schedule, I'm not sure if you've ever DJed before, the mental exhaustion, having to stand up the whole time, um, moving around in clubs, which is not the easiest place to move around, even if you're going behind the backstage doors and stuff, whatever, it's incredibly tiring, really, really is tiring. 
So there's no, I don't think there's any way that you could do it, especially in the beginning, right? Without abusing some sort of substances, without going through the whole class A drug kind of journey, right? And then maybe towards the end of it, especially even with alcohol, maybe towards the end of it, you will reach a point where you start to become cognitive of how you get when you start to drink and how it affects your the ability to DJ and you might start tampering it. Me being a good example, um, I used to get on it or drink whilst I was DJing, right? But now, um, since like probably the beginning of the year, since I've been coming, like been doing it more professionally, I've been doing it more often every single month. And because I'm being counted, I'm relied on, and I've got, I've got this pressure. I kind of got my inbuilt pressure to kind of make sure that I impress so people can call me back. I will maybe only have a drink two hours into my set which is really rare for me. If you know how I am and how I go out and how, how I do things, how I go out there, you'll know that, you know, having a drink two hours into my set is very, like, out of character. Usually I'll have, like, loads of pre-drinks at home, duh, 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 especially if I'm going on a night out. That's kind of what I do. And so, and before they, bef back in the day, I just, like, copy that lifestyle and just integrate into my DJ. But then I realized that it would only fuck up my DJing and it would only make me more cognitive to the time, which is weird, right? You wouldn't think that, but I noticed whenever I got on it well, whilst I was DJing, I was more aware of how, what the time was. I knew how long things were taking. I was like dreading the next hour and a half or I was like, oh my God, I don't have enough tunes. Oh my God, I I'm going to fuck up. You know what I mean? Just like those little mental games you play with yourself. But when I'm not drinking or when I'm just kind of really in the zone and I'm really kind of in, in pocket and I'm just kind of concentrating on, on what I'm doing, right? The time doesn't go anywhere. I mean, the time kind of stands still, but always, and but also moves quickly. It's a weird, it kind of like works in the same way. Ah, oh, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of when I took acid when I went to um, uh, Primavera last, or this year, right? I remember lying down on my bed and I took acid, right, for the first time. And I remember looking over to the table because I had like a glass of whiskey with some, um, a glass of whiskey and Coke on the table. No, it was just a glass of whiskey with a couple, couple of ice cubes, right? Some big ice cubes. And what I remember seeing was the ice melting really quickly. But then the water going, um, rising up really fast. So the, the ice mel melting really slowly, but the water rising up really fast, like in unison. So it goes, it was so freaky. And then my senses of my ears would just kind of get really sensitive and I could hear birds that were like miles and miles away. It sounded like, like, like they were fucking in, like literally in my ears. It was fucking so insane, so amazing, but it kind of freaked me out a little bit. And I was plus I was I, I wasn't the best acid participant because I was really resisting it. I was really like kind of holding on and not wanting to let go. Kind of when I when I took my first time when I took MDMA, I was like just holding on, like no, must not swing my jaw. Uh! I mean, and you shouldn't do that. It's just like you know, let it go. Um, but yeah, um, there is a there is a kind of you have to go through it, right? So I, I kind of have sympathy for Jack Master for going through it. And looking at his tour schedule now on, on Resident Advisor, right? Up and coming events that he's doing. This this is this is an insane schedule already. Just look at the locations, right? He's playing he's playing at Sonus he's playing at Sonus Festival, right? Uh this Sunday in Croatia. Then he, from there he goes next Sunday to Sweden. I'm sure does he live in Glasgow still or does he live in London? I'm not too sure if he lives in so that might mean he might go back to Glasgow. So from so from Croatia, he might go back to Glasgow during the week, then fly back out to Sweden, right? On a Sunday. And then the week after that, fly back out to uh I back to Ibiza. And then for my beefer, he might go in because there's a, there's a break between the 20th and the 15th. He might then go back home and then fly to Tokyo on the 15th of September. And then after that, from Tokyo, he goes to Bali on the same day, right? Then he comes, then from Bali, he flies back to the UK. So that's a 14 hour flight, right? So let's not, 14, 13 hour flight. Then from the UK, so he comes back to the Fly Open Air Festival in the UK on the 20, 22nd of, of September. Then from there, he goes um, and flies to Manchester. So it's Edinburgh, Manchester on the 28th. Then on the 29th, he goes to Bristol. Then on the 27th of August, he's at Glasgow. And these are all the dates that have been confirmed. The stuff in between hasn't been confirmed yet. It's like, oh my fucking God, right? That event list is amazing. And if you check, let's check the past ones that come up, right? So it's, how could you not do drugs? How could you not go fucked up, get fucked up on substances? It's impossible. Look at that, look at that schedule from July. I'm just gonna say from July, right? So this is this is what he's doing from July. This is absolutely insane, man. I didn't even know that the schedule. So in July, he on the first of July, he played at Electric Island in Canada, in Toronto. Then he flew to um, Turin in Italy on a Saturday to play for Saturday the seventh of July, and the eighth and the and the Sunday the eighth of July. So at the weekend on Saturday and Sunday in Turin. 
Then from there, from the 13th, he flew back to London and, f- and played at the Revolution Day Stop Trump, Stop Brexit party and protest. <laughs> that didn't work, did it, brothers? Then uh, he played at Love Box on the same day. Then from there, he flew to Canary Islands and played at Greenwood Camouflage. Then he played at Samian Dance with Seth Troxler at Paris and 14th. Then Circa Loco on the 16th. Then on 28th, he played in Portugal. 28th in Portugal again. Circa Loco in Ibiza. Never World again back in London. Um, Love Fest. Jesus Christ. It's insane, man. That schedule's insane. So, yes, it was a funny story. You shit into a kettle, but I would shit into a kettle too if I was playing those kind of tour dates. It, it just, it's just impossible to do it sober. It's impossible. Literally impossible. Especially in the beginning. Now, when he's kind of coming, coming up to his pump, maybe he'll get to a point where, like um, Seth Troxler did, right? Where he kind of, I think he he can even says like his engagement kind of broke down because of his touring and not being around. And or, you know, maybe substance abuse played into it as well. Maybe, you know, he had a bit of a wandering eye. We don't know what the story was, but he's now kind of like sober for the most part. I know he smokes weed. So maybe he might get to that point too, but I'm just, I don't know. I have a bit of sympathy towards it. And also the weird thing as well, you know what? If this story is true, um, this is as to his legend. It adds to the legend of Jackmaster. Like, people would want to book him even more now. You know what I mean? He probably might start DJing behind a booth and just pull out a kettle. You know, like that DJ. Who's that DJ that pulls out a plant? Like, hey, everyone, big up this plant, man. Speak up whoever gave me this plant. There's some DJ that did that kind of thing. Imagine if he just comes up behind a DJ booth and has a kettle behind him and pours himself a cup of tea. That would be fucking amazing. Um, so, yeah, um, <laughs> big up Jackmaster. I still love you, brother. Um, and I, I can feel your pain. I, can, I feel your pain. I've been there, my friend. Do not worry. Um, what else? British tourist m- uh, moans that her Benidorm holiday was ruined by too many Spanish people. Now, I thought this was like an Onion article, but unfortunately, it's actually real. And it made me laugh. No end. No end. No end made me laugh. It's so fucking funny. What a great story, right? Um, so, I guess on face value, it is was accurate. This isn't the tin. And it kind of does basically... <laughs> It's 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 the tr- it's a common trope that everyone uses whenever they speak about Brexit people, right? The people that voted against Brexit or voted in favour of Brexit are the same people who kind of enjoy their sunny holidays in uh, Fuerteventura, Canary Islands, Benidorm, all those kind of places in Spain, right? They kind of enjoy this uh, this kind of um, their f- this free frictionless travel in between um, places in Spain and Portugal and places in Italy and France and stuff, especially on the coast. And they build these little weird english enclaves because I, I remember seeing a lot of this when i wish to watch um homes abroad with my mum back in the day if you remember that tv show it's fucking one of the best shows ever right and one of the that used to present it she had the fattest ass right so she was really hot but it was a really good cool show because it was really interesting to see british people who'd go to an area somewhere in europe and just build their own little british village they wouldn't integrate at all the only, the only time it you only saw any, the only time you saw any sort of integration was when the wife especially the wife not usually the husband when the wife was um an artist or somebody that was very um culturally aware somebody that was you know used to i don't know had like fucking african statues like those wooden do you know those white people that have those african wooden statues in their house they're obsessed with kenyan that kind of stuff they're the ones right they'll go to those kind of countries and be obsessed with the culture and want to integrate themselves right want to speak spanish want to go to all the local meat markets and speak to locals and all that stuff hang out like that's the only time it happened and they kind of drag their partner kicking and screaming into the into that kind of you know um assimilation uh, phase but if they were both, if the, if both people were hardcore Brits or just like general average people, they'd they'd what it would end up happening is that they'll go their homes abroad thing. They'd um and ah over a house. The presenter will get annoyed because they're not picking the obvious choice. They'll pick the obvious choice in the end and end up paying two times the value for it. Then they'll visit and back again in two or three months and they'll be super and anno- super like um bummed that whole experience and not they don't really integrate it. They don't feel comfortable. They haven't really made any friends. But they haven't really made any effort. But then sometimes they'll make an effort, but they'll only have British friends and they'll build these little weird villages where they have fish and chip shops and like fry up shops and stuff where they serve baked beans and stuff. It's just like it used to really um freak me out. But it was a common trope. People used to always say like a little dig people used to make at people are like everyone that voted for Brexit is the same people that would go to these kind of places and complain that there were too many Spanish people. And this story is actually the actual thing. It's actually true. So the story in the Daily Mirror, which I'm again, I'm, I'm taking it with a pinch of salt. If someone else says it's not true and I've been duped, it is, but it's just funny to read. The British tourist moans her Benidorm holiday was ruined by too many Spanish people. Um, it reads as following. A British woman has, ca- has claimed her holiday in ben- to Benidorm was ruined because her hotel had too many Spaniards in it. Frida Jackson, 81, said that the Spanish people should go somewhere else for their holidays and she cried at the end of her two-week w- two trip. Uh, what? 
Spanish people should go some Spanish people who live in Spain should go somewhere else in Spain because you want to go to Benidorm. Uh, at what? And also the bit about crying. Now, I know this might sound a bit callous, right? But I don't give a flying fuck if a girl cries. It doesn't change me. I don't, I feel nothing when a girl cries. I think my mum made me desensitized to crying. Because I think you, the first time you see your mum cry about something that you did, right? Because you annoyed her or you didn't clean up the dishes. or You know, mums just overreact about the tiniest of things, right? It's never, they're never crying because you murdered somebody, right? It's always some sort of insequential stuff because you didn't want to go to the shots for them. Whatever, right? I know, you put me, you, you, you carried me in the stomach for nine months and you gave birth to me or whatever, but I don't care. <laughs> um, I don't owe you anything. Um, but seeing your mum constantly cry over the most minute thing really desensitizes you to crying right then when you get a girlfriend right and she cries over the tiniest of things or gets emotional oh, i'm feeling really stressed out oh, i'm really nervous I'm, I'm shaking all this sort of shit you just you just don't care you just think okay that's just the way girls express themselves it's not an actual because i think when you're younger or when you see it for the first time you actually think they're sad right because you associate crying with like real heartbreak, like real um, men, uh, uh, real distraught, right? Someone that's really sad, that's really broken up about something. But some people or some women in general cry as just a reflective emotion, right? It's like sort of like when you're really happy about it, when you're overly excited. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. Incredibles 2, I can't wait to watch it, right? And some people just like cry when they just, um, I don't know, when they just feel uncomfortable. You start crying or start shaking. Do that shaking thing. Oh my God, I'm shaking right now. Okay, I can't handle it. It's like, what? Huh? You see that ledge over there? Walk, walk, walk right up towards it, right? Lean forward and fall down, right? Please. Um, anyway, it continues, right? Uh, the pensioner who suffers from mobility issues says her accommodations was teeming with rude native Spaniards who nearly knocked her over on one occasion. Oh, knocked over an 81-year-old woman because she'd walk in too slow. Move! Get the fuck out of the way! <laughs> Retired Karen Frida said the hotel was full of Spanish holidaymakers and they really got on our nerves because they were just so rude. Why? Because they were speaking Spanish and couldn't understand them? Take a hearing aid out! One evening, a Spanish guy nearly knocked me flying and we, he just kept walking without even really apologising. Because he didn't see you! When the entertainment hotel was all focused on catered for the Spanish, why can't Spanish go somewhere else for their holidays? Why can't you? Honestly, the rage I'd feel if I heard this guy, woman say this to me in real life. He continues, Frida had booked to stay at the Poseidon Playa, uh, Poseidon Playa, located on the outskirts of Benidorm in, in, in South East of Spain, with a friend in April 2017. The pension says the travel operator, Thomas, Thomas Cook, uh, had even recommended a hotel and despite her request for flat ground access she was located on a slope instead oh no a slope ah! oh. oh talk about slope right i saw this lady at liverpool street station who was who was obviously fucked out of her head like drunk um probably an alcoholic because uh, she looked really uh, well adjusted but for the most part everything on her body was inflamed she had like red ankles red hands red face so she looked like she just you know alcoholic but her dress looked like she didn't look like a, 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 a tramp right so she was walking down the stairs and i remember seeing someone walking down the stairs and i thought why is she taking so long to walk down the stairs she was standing there says liverpool Street station but kind of holding onto it and leaning forward right then she'd let go of the let go of the bar and kind of let her gravity she kind of do a good it's kind of like pose running it was only pose run you're meant to kind of lean like michael jackson and then you're kind of let to, you're kind of meant to lean so uh, meant to lean just enough that you let kind of gravity pull you forward and then as soon as that happens you start running and trying to flick your heels be, up, up to your bum that's kind of the perfect running technique so i saw her doing that so she kind of let go of the bar lean a bit forward and let her gravity take kind of like throw her down the stairs but she kind of let her feet kind of like you know paddle down the stairs and she kind of got down the bottom and saw the justice of us. I was like what the fuck she's girl doing she if she would have leant forward two more inches she would have busted her head open on the floor anyway she carries on walking and she's walking to this woman who I thought might have been her daughter or some someone next to her so I thought maybe this is a care or whatever but then she split so they kind of started walking separately but she continued walking like tilting forward like you know that kind of meth addict walk where they're kind of walking and they're leaning and they kind of like nearly go, uh, uh, uh. But she wasn't swaying. She was like leaning forward the whole time. 
and then she finally got past MNS, and then as she was leaning forward, and I said, and I kind of giggled to the African, the, the kind of African security guard on the door. He might not be African, might be Jamaican, whatever. The black dude at the door. I kind of smiled and winked towards him. He was like, "Yeah, this woman looks fucked." And as she was leaning, leaning, leaning towards the door, she just, just before she was about to get to the pub, the little police station, she just like lent him, bam, fell on the floor. Like you know how women fall on the floor, no brace or whatever. She just ate the complete concrete, and I was laughing so hard, right? And I cut, I caught this woman's eye, and she was like, "Oh." I can't, you know, she gave me that disgusting look. Like, oh, I can't believe you're laughing. Man, fuck off, man. She's a, probably a drunk or whatever. I don't know. It's funny. She fell on the floor. And it made me laugh because, you know, the whole slope thing. Like, this lady, she can't walk. She can't, only can walk on flat ground. No sloping. And, you know, there's centurions in this book, right, who are 100 years old, right, who tend to their own gardens, right, who tend to their own farms, right, who go and get water out of a well and walk back two miles to their... Uh, house who sleep on the floor and stand up and down every single day then not 100 sometimes at 91 years old and this woman's 81 look where she's sitting in a, in a sort of reclining we're so soft aren't we we're so soft look how soft she is look at her complaining happily happily complaining getting a little five minutes in in the fucking fame it's like uh, it's amazing but the hypocrisy of of some people man like vote for brexit or whatever just you know what i mean just forget the brexit thing imagine going to another country and complaining that there's too many natives in that country it's like ah what and also, I'm, I don't really buy it. I don't, I don't, I've, have you heard of Spanish people going to resorts in Bonedom? I don't really think that's true. I don't know if that is true. Maybe the new generation do that. But usually they do. They, usually Spanish people do everything within their power to leave Spain during the times when everyone tourists come. That's, probably, that's usually what everyone does, right? That's what people do when, uh, in kind of like places like Barcelona, Berlin and stuff. They get out of the city when all the tourists come during the summer because it's just they can't bear it. But yeah, I thought the story was amazing. I thought it was funny. I'll link it to the show so you guys can check out yourself. But yeah, that might be a good place to end it. It's been an hour, and that's kind of my cue, in it? But ding ding. This will be episode number 94 of the Agus Nose English Show. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been an absolute blast. As always, I'll go to see you guys again tomorrow. Um, I'm going to have a jam-packed show because I have a lot more time to it because I'm off. So maybe maybe to stretch it to maybe a two-hour show. You never fucking know. I've got more things to talk about. Supreme drops as well. I'm going to go through some of my hot picks that I liked in the Supreme Collection. I'm going to put it into a little album so I can kind of show you guys and all these other nice, amazing goodness. Anyway, um, as always, this podcast is brought to you by Audible to claim one free book credit. There's a 30-day free trial. Click the link below. Hit that link at audible.com for slash aggie. That's audible.com for slash A-double-G-G-Y to claim one free book credit for 30 days, right? And you can, I'm reading at the moment the Leonardo da Vinci um, autobiography by Walter Isaacson or unofficial autobiography because the guy's dead, but he read the famous book on Steve Jobs, so I definitely recommend you check that out too. Audible is a great audio book experience. It's got over 400,000 titles for you to choose from. 400,000. And as always, link to my Patreon below. If you like what I do and you want to buy me a beer for the weekend, please do. Happily to happy to receive it. Um, I'll be DJing this Friday at Tap East for a night called Tapped at Tap East in Westford Stratford from 7 to 11. But the night starts at 5. So if you're in the area, come and check me out. All my links, all my social, all that stuff can be found in the link below. I'll see you guys again tomorrow. And you have a great afternoon. Peace.